are in the land of eating and drinking and rejoicing before the Lord because the Lord has freed us from the fetters and the chains of poverty and released us from our sin. And we are a blessed people. We have entered into the blessing of Abraham and eating and drinking and rejoicing is our life. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We cry, holy, 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 we cry. Cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The message that Luke has is a particular message. In that they say he is presenting Jesus like a prophet, like the, like the prophet Moses. He is another Moses. He is our Moses. That's the way Luke wants to present it. Luke is the one that wrote Acts of the Apostles also. And he says there in the first couple of chapters, he says, Peter says when he preaches, he says, to Moses, uh, Moses told us that he will send a, God will send a prophet like unto him and that we must listen to him. That's this prophet, that is Jesus that has come and died and risen again now. So the story is continued. He wrote the gospel and then I think he continues the same trend back uh, there in, in, the, in the book of Acts also. Now, so think of it like this. He sees Jesus as a prophet. Turn with me to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, which is just about uh, the middle of the gospel according to Luke. He puts a very important story there. The story of the transfiguration. 
deliberately to show that there is a likeness between Moses and Jesus. There is a similarity between Moses and Jesus. Deliberately to impress upon the readers, to help readers understand and see that this Jesus he is talking about and that he is presenting through his gospel is another Moses. So he puts this story deliberately there in Luke chapter 9. Let me read to you from verse 28. Now it came to, it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. That means it was shining. They say that as soon as the Jewish people read this, they will immediately understand this as another Moses because they remember Moses going up Mount Sinai and his face shone because he was in the presence of God. When he came down, they cannot even look up and see his face. They had to cover their face because they could not look at him because his face was shining. So they will, you know, they say they'll think like that and he's deliberately doing this. He's putting the story right in the center so that it will be the thing that uh, will guide the rest of the, uh, the, the whole uh, understanding of the whole book. So, like Moses, Jesus is up on a mountain. Like Moses, he became white and glistening. His robe became white and glistening and he was shining. And behold, two men talked with him, verse 30, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his disease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Spoke about the cross and all that's going to happen to him with Jesus. Just imagine Jesus standing on the mountain. He's just, his robe is white and glistening. And uh, two men, Moses and Elijah, are coming and talking to him, doing some consultation about what's going to happen in Jerusalem. Jesus is now going to go to Jerusalem and they're getting him ready. They're talking to him about the things that are going to transpire there by way of crucifixion and so on. Verse 32, but Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened as they were parting from him, then Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. This is a third similarity. Mountain, glistening, white glistening, <laughs> shining, and then a cloud came and descended upon them. And they were fearful as they entered the cloud. Same thing that happened in the Mount Sinai for Moses. And then a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. That's exactly the same thing that happened to Moses also when he went up to Mount Sinai. A voice came. So, you must always, when you read the Bible, you must always, first of all, think about the original readers, how they would have thought about it, because he was writing to them. And then only you must think about how we should think about it, right? That's the way, that's when you will understand it properly. Because he's got the original leaders, readers in mind, and he's writing, and how would they have thought about it? They say, my God, this is another Moses. Moses indeed did say that God is going to send us another prophet just like him. And that we ought to take care and listen to his words and do what he says. So Jesus is another Moses. And that is big in the eyes of the Jewish people. Jewish people thought of Moses as next to God, you know. He was a great figure. He's the one that brought them out of Egypt. And he's, he's, he has done so many great and mighty things. And Moses is not an ordinary person. See, people like Abraham and Moses are big in the eyes of the Jewish people. And now they're thinking, wow, this Jesus, we thought he's just a man that is from Nazareth preaching around doing things. You know, he's another Moses. You know, so many questions and doubts are about him. So many people say so many things about him. But he's another Moses. According to what Luke is saying, he's just, he's, he's another Moses. In fact, he may be greater than Moses. He's the one that Moses spoke about. Now, after this, they come down, and that's when that journey to Jerusalem begins. Journey to Jerusalem begins. Now, it's very similar to the journey 
that Moses undertook from the slavery of Egypt, leading them all the way to the borders of the promised land, right? And then there he dies, and then they enter into the promised land. Jesus also leads his disciples and those who believed in him and followed him all the way to Jerusalem, and there he dies, and then they enter in to their salvation and the inheritance of all the blessings of Abraham. And then the story begin, uh, continues in the book of Acts because in the book of Acts, actually Luke begins saying, I already wrote to you in my gospel these things, but now I continue the story, he says. <laughs> After Pentecost, the story uh, continues where they go in and possess the land, they possess, inherit their promises, and they uh, possess all the blessings of God which are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Now, that's the way to look at it, they say. Now, what is the goal of Moses? Uh, the goal of Moses is to take him to the promised land. He says, he says that God told him that he has come down hearing the cry of the people of Israel to deliver them and then to take them to a land flowing with milk and honey. Right? So the goal of Moses is to teach the people in the book of Deuteronomy particularly, it is the it is goal to teach the people to believe God and not be like the previous generation that failed to enter the promised land, but believe God and in, enter into the promised land and inherit all the promises of God, the blessings of the covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And uh, in that book of Deuteronomy, you can say even from Exodus to Deuteronomy, but particularly in Deuteronomy, you know how big this idea of eating and drinking is? The idea of eating and drinking is very big there, you know. You would be surprised. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, I already, we already dealt with, but let's look at it once again. Look at the description of the land. It's all about eating and drinking description. It's, eating, it's described in terms of eating and drinking. That's the main item there. <laughs> Look at that. Verse 7, chapter 8, verse 7. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron and whose hills you can dig copper. Out of whose hills you can dig copper. And then it says, listen to this. When you have eaten and are full. Hello. Everybody say eaten and are full. <laughs> now you will understand why Jesus was behaving like that. Why? Because he's another Moses. He has not come to teach poverty. He has not come to lead people into poverty. He has come to lead people into the promised land, the real promised land, into Christ, into all the blessings that God has ordained from before the world began, the author of Hebrews says. He has come to bring prosperity. He has bring, come to bring total well-being, materially, spiritually, in every way. He's not come here, you know, this will clear up your misunderstanding about Jesus forever, you know. He has not come to teach prosper, uh, poverty. He has come to teach well-being totally. So he says, oh, this land that you're going to, the land of brooks and of water, fountains and springs, flows out of valleys and hills, land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees, pomegranates and land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you lack nothing, land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are full, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given to you. Now, I've read only one verse here, one passage here. But you know, this idea comes again and again. When they grow their first crop, when the, when, the, when the first fruit of the crop comes in the promised land, Moses is telling them, when you go there and when you sow and when your land begins to yield by the blessings of God, you bring the first fruits and you rejoice before the Lord. And there are feasts that are ordained. There are three feasts, feasts you know, the Bible talks about. 
and um, the three feasts are about eating hello it's about eating and drinking god wants the people to come together and eat and drink and rejoice people say what kind of god is this god <laughs> now you must understand they were in poverty they were having half stomach full in egypt they had nothing there they were suffering in poverty and he brings them out of that he brings them into the promised land now he loves to see them sit there and enjoy god's blessings god's abundance their lands grow the grains come in and them make those nice breads and make the nice curries and lamb shacks and whatever you know have you had those lamb shacks in the middle east you know boy they're nice i'm sure they had that <laughs> and god wants to see them eat good and uh, have everything to eat and drink and uh, be joyful he says eat and drink and rejoice in the lord and thank the lord for all the blessings so when jesus came he was into it already <laughs> because he has come to take them to that he has not come to propagate poverty he has not come to you know exemplify poverty contrary to what people think he has not come to show how you know you can live with the, as little as possible he has not come to teach asceticism which is leaving everything having nothing or utilitarianism which is having only as much as what you need two pants and two shirts two sarees two churidars <laughs> no more than two if you had more than two you are a sinner he did, see some people teach the, all these things they think jesus came jesus never came to teach that Jesus came to teach that we are in the land of eating and drinking and rejoicing before the Lord because the Lord has freed us from the fetters and the chains of poverty and released us from our sin and we are a blessed people we have entered into the blessing of Abraham and eating and drinking and rejoicing is our life hello that's why in the new testament times when the church came together they ate together <laughs> they sang and worshiped and ate and all that because that's part of it it is a celebration no wonder then that jesus was celebrating so much around the table because he has come to take the people into the promised land he is on a journey taking them into the promised land he has not come to propagate poverty he has come to tell them about that good land where they will lack nothing eat bread without scarcity and eat to the full and be satisfied and lack nothing now all those stories will make sense all those stories will make sense now go to the stories now chapter 7 of luke verse 33 for john the baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine and you say he's a, he has a demon they have a problem you know see john the baptist represented the idea of repentance the people of israel were backslidden they have forgotten their god he has come to turn their eyes back to god come to call them to repentance so one of the ways that the old testament repentance happened when they're sorry they put ashes on themselves and repented and fasted you know fasted is a way fasting is a way of saying i'm sorry i've been wrong you know fasting is a way of being sorry for all the sins that you've done you know so john the baptist came in that way he came not eating and not drinking wine and you say he has a demon they could not understand him why is he doing that they did not see the need for repentance they did not see that they need to go go to god empty themselves and say lord you know without you i am nothing i need your help i repent i come to you no they didn't see all that they said he's got a demon then the son of man came eating and drinking and you say 
Look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by all her children. Children means by all that it produces. Okay. In other words, he's saying, if you just look at what I produce, you'll know whether I'm a glutton or a wine bibber or what, you know. My products show what kind of a person I am. What comes out of my ministry, my life, will show who I am. Ultimately, that's the proof. You shall know them by their fruit, right? They could not comprehend Jesus. They said, how can this man, he must not be a spiritual man. If he's a spiritual man, see their thing is, in our town, if you're spiritual, you fast. You're always fasting. How come this guy, where did he come from? He's not fasting. He's not fasting enough at least. Why is he not fasting? He's always eating and drinking. They could not understand. Well, if they understood that this is Moses, and Moses is not, is not about fasting. Moses is about promised land. Moses is a prophet that has come to speak about the promised land and the blessing of the promised land of milk and honey, right? And he has come to take people there. His message is not leading into poverty. His message is leading into the blessings of God, into the fullness of life. So, as soon as you understand that, you will understand why Jesus' activity was more celebrative with festive meals. Celebrating what? Celebrating the presence of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come. You know. So he celebrates every meal, every fellowship. Every time they sat around the table, they fellowshiped eating and uh, eating and drinking and celebrating the presence of the kingdom. So immediately, once you understand that Jesus has come, he represents a totally different ideology. He's, he's taking the people into the promised land. He's another Moses. You know, he's not here to talk about poverty. How can Moses talk about poverty? He came to deliver people from poverty. They were in poverty. They were in Egypt in poverty. He came to deliver them from the chains of poverty and nothingness and brought them into the promised land. How can our new Moses, Jesus, who is Moses, talk about poverty? If he is Moses, then he will not be talking about prosper, poverty. He'll be talking about the good and vast land, land flowing with milk and honey. See, immediately, you know, you begin to understand what this is all about. The second passage is Luke chapter 5, verse 33. Then they said to him, why do, disciples, why do the disciples of John fast often? and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. John the Baptist's disciples fast and pray. Pharisees' disciples also do the same. They are very prayer champions they are. They've made a religion out of prayer, you know. You know, in so many religious circles, they've made a religion out of how many hours did you pray? How many days do you fast? They have made a total religion out of prayer and fasting. You know, they, they've got a whole set of rules about fasting, prayer, and, and all that business, you know. And the Pharisees were about that. I think they, as soon as you meet them, they'll say, on what days do you fast? How many days did you fast this week? How many hours do you pray today? You know, prayer is a religious activity for them. You know, that's why they're counting the time and say, oh, it's one hour, I prayed one hour today. Tonight I'll pray one hour. You know, that's the way they took it, you know. And it's never like that. Prayer is talking to God, my friend. And you want to talk to God as much as possible, you know. You're not looking at your watch, you know. Well, God, I got to go, you know. <laughs> it's not like that. You are, in, you are talking to God. It's, it's, it's the most precious time uh, of the day, you see. Clapping your hands if you can with me, all right?
Speed.